So uh, we are continuing uh, our Divine Principle Bible study, where we're looking deeply into the, uh, not only just uh, reading through the Bible, but trying to understand the principles and the, the deep truths behind it. So uh, this time, uh, beginning today, we're going to probably divide it up into three parts. We're going to be looking at how man separated from God and from the ideal that we talked about uh, previously when we studied God's principles of creation. So uh, I'm sure we wish that uh, there was only good in the world, right? We wish that uh, evil never came to exist. And yet the reality is we experience both good and evil in this world. Uh, what is the origin of the evil we see in the world today? And uh, a couple, I've been to the doctor a couple of times lately just for some checkups. And uh, I noticed that, um, you know, when a person is sick and visits the doctor for help, uh, if it's a good doctor, he's going to try to determine the cause of the illness, and then he's going to seek to resolve that underlying cause. So if a doctor were just to look at your symptoms, maybe if somebody had a, a bad rash or something all over the body, he could say, well, I'll just put some cream on it and cover it up with bandages. However, if the actual cause of the uh, illness of those rashes is not determined, the patient's health could continue to deteriorate and that person could even die. So in the same way as we look at the state of the world today, and we try to deal with our personal, family, and societal problems uh, with which we are confronted, uh, we have to you know, think about what is the real original cause of that evil so that we can deal with the cause and not just the symptoms. So uh, we started off uh, in our series talking about God's idea of creation, the three blessings. So, one thing a doctor has to know is he has to know what is the standard of health for a person? What should that health be? So for example, when he takes your temperature, he already knows uh, the temperature should be 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, right? He has a certain standard and he knows, well, if that, if that temperature is way off, if it's much lower or even much higher than that, then there's, there's some kind of serious problem. So, even if there are a bunch of people, let's say he got a lot of calls and, and, and several people came in with a higher temperature, uh, what is that doctor going to do? He's not going to say, well, since all these people came in with 104 temperature, well, we'll say that the, uh, the normal is 104, the standard is 104, and just say that that's normal. Uh, but that's not what the doctor does. He, he knows that there's a reality of how the body is supposed to function, that the standard remains constant. So it's, it's very important that we understand the original standard for God's ideal, that that is God's ideal of creation, the three blessings. What is the standard for the lives of uh, human beings as individuals, families, and society? So in our earlier presentations, we discussed that standard, uh, a standard which was not determined by us, not created by us, but det determined by God, who is our creator. So this standard could be summarized as the fulfillment of these three blessings to be fruitful. That's the perfection or maturity of the individual to have to multiply, to create a family of love centered on God and have dominion of love over the creation. This is the standard, the, the gold standard for the kingdom of heaven on earth and, and, uh, and also in the eternal spiritual world. So had Adam and Eve fulfilled their portion of responsibility, you know, God gave them those uh, three blessings and gave them a commandment. If they had kept that commandment, if there had been no fall, there would be no sin and there would be no need for salvation. And we wouldn't even need religion. So the word religion means to reconnect. It has to do with reconnecting to God because we lost that connection to God through the fall. So if we really think about it, if there was no fall, we wouldn't even need religion. So um, human beings have been... Um, have been living separated from God, but if there was no fall, we would have dwelled with God in the in the kingdom of heaven on earth, right? That, that would be our daily life and our daily experience. So in the world of God's ideal, human beings would live in freedom and happiness with each family, establishing its own mini kingdom within God's kingdom. So the men would, every man would be like a king or priest of their own household. The women would be queens and evangelists. So we, we must be really clear about this point because we, there's really no way to understand what evil is and, and what its nature is unless we understand the original standard to com compare it to. And as Jesus taught us to pray, and people pray sometimes just out of habit, 
Uh, he taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So God's intention was to establish his kingdom on the earth, beginning with Adam and Eve. So, uh, however, we know the reality of our world is that it, it is not the kingdom of heaven. Human society is filled with people living in the midst of loneliness, suffering, confusion, and war. Families which should be the center of peace and harmony and love are often plagued by disunity, divorce, and betrayal. So not only have we hurt people around us, humanity has also treated creation, all of nature, with cruelty and disrespect. So if human beings were created to experience the joy of God's infinite and ever-present love, why is there so much suffering? Why is there so much confusion in our lives? Why has the world been plagued with such suffering and violence, abuse, and war throughout human history? The pain and suffering that human beings have inflicted on themselves and on one another is immeasurable. So here we have some pictures of some of the, uh, the horrible atrocities that man has done to man you know, in the last century, and even tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people uh, have been killed through various um, acts of aggression and violence. So the problems of our world, however, are not just external. So while we have crime, abuse, and war happening constantly around the world, we have to recognize the problems we see are a reflection of the internal struggle within each and every human being. And people wouldn't act in evil and destructive ways right? if they were filled with the love of God, right? So this, the problem is not just something going on outside. It's inside of the human beings. And every person, as we know, has some sort of struggle, right? We all have sin. No one is without sin. So even though uh, we may know what is right and good, there's a darker side that, that includes self-doubt, could be addictions, physical and psychological abuse, and other things and other types of struggles. So here, uh, the Bible, the Bible is an amazing book because while you would think that if uh, if a group of people wanted to show the greatness of their religion, the greatness of their God, and how you know how wonderful it is, they wouldn't want to talk about bad things or negative things. But here in Romans 7, 15 to 24, St. Paul honestly describes his own conflicting nature. He says, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in the members, in my members, another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members, in my physical body. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So let's take a closer look at this state of fallen man. So at the individual level, uh, we all desire peace, right? We desire goodness, we desire harmony and love, and yet all human beings experience this contradictory nature. And while we have a desire to do good and follow our conscience, to experience that peace and joy, uh, we often act in direct contradiction to our deepest desire for goodness. And although we desire to act out of love and goodness, we often act out of selfishness and evil. Rather than feeling joy and satisfaction by doing this, we often feel guilt, shame, and emptiness. So this struggle between good and evil within human nature has been expressed through religion, and also through literature, through art and music, throughout the long course of human history. And even though science has made a lot of progress helping to improve many aspects of our physical existence, it has not, res not resolved the struggle between good and evil. Right? A lot of people look to science as, you know, as the hope to give us the answer and to make a good world. But the reality is that science uh, can and has been used for both good and evil purposes. And also since science focuses on the human body and the physical world, science cannot resolve this invisible internal contradiction that is within human beings. 
So by understanding the original cause of evil itself, we can then learn the process through which God has been working to rid fallen man of evil and to restore our original nature. So we, uh, in, in previous lecture, in the principle of creation, we identified God as the origin of the universe. So God is also the origin of goodness and truth and true love. God is also a unified, harmonious being of goodness, it means he's only good, right? If God had both good and evil, this would be an inherent contradictory nature. God would be contradicting himself. He would not have been able to create this beautiful and complex universe. So we can say that God is the master of all things good. So we must conclude that evil, this contradictory nature that's also within human beings, must have a different origin, that this evil mind did not come from God. So in Christianity, this master and origin of evil is known as Satan. So although we, uh, we can read the story of the fall in the book of Genesis and understand that Satan and evil exist, uh, we have not really had a full understanding of the root of sin. So I wanted to remind everybody of Jesus' words uh, about truth, about God's word, uh, as he spoke in, in John 16 and Matthew 5. I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. I have said this to you in figures. The hour is coming when I shall no longer speak to you in figures, but tell you plainly of the Father. So Jesus, again, confirmed that he would reveal through other people, through people in the future, he would re reveal uh, further truth. And he also said in Matthew 5, 48, therefore you shall be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Right? God really wants us to fulfill our original purpose. And certainly there's no perfection in ignorance. Uh, we are blessed to be able to receive God's word and put it into practice so that we may more closely resemble our heavenly father. So the more completely we can understand God's word, the more we can resemble God. And in this case, the more we can deal with the root of sin. So let's, let's take a look at um, what, the, what the Bible says. Uh, Jews and Christians can read the Genesis account of Adam and Eve falling by disobeying God's commandment not to eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we can read, this is how evil came into the world. So traditionally, people of faith have believed this to be a literal account of what actually happened in the Garden of Eden. But let's take a, a fresh look at the biblical explanation of the fall in order to try to understand it from God's viewpoint. The story of the fall is told in Genesis uh, chapter 3. So before the fall, in Genesis chapter 2, uh, we read that God gave a commandment to Adam. It says, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So here, again, God is giving a warning to Adam uh, to not eat from that one particular tree. So then in chapter 3, we, found, we find the account of the temptation and the fall. It's interesting also to note, um, as we'll, we'll see in this in this. Uh, in these verses here, uh, back in chapter two, to whom did God give the commandment? It says he told Adam, right? He told Adam. But if you read this, uh, we'll find out that somehow Eve also knew the commandment, and she also knew that the commandment applied to her. So it doesn't say whether it was God directly who told her or Adam, you know, shared that with her. But uh, anyway, let's, let's see what, what it says here in Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, 
God has said, you shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So in the, in the Bible, we mentioned it, it mentions two particular trees by name, right? There's all kinds of trees in the garden, but two that it names. Um, and these were not apple trees or peach trees. Rather, they're referred to as the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So what is the real significance of these two trees in the garden, which are so crucial to the story of mankind and the fulfillment of God's original plan? And what about this uh, talking serpent? Uh, and also the fruit of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil. So we, we've never seen in a literal sense a talking snake or a fruit that could you know, determine good or evil, right? That could make us good or, or evil. So what was really at the root of, of all the evil of mankind? So when we read the Bible, we often find that it makes use of symbols and metaphors to uh, express God's truth. For example, uh, Jesus tells us in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. However, nobody thought that Jesus was an actual literal vine or that he had literal branches. We understand that when Jesus compared himself to a vine or a tree with branches, he did not intend for it to be taken literally. So what then was this fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Right? So we have a lot of questions here. And uh, as far as the, this um, commandment, was the fruit there just a test there to be a test of Adam and Eve's obedience? Did God just come up with some kind of test? There are those who believe that God made the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and commanded Adam and Eve not to eat it in order to test their obedience to him. And we may ask, would the God of love test humans so severely by a means that could cause their death? Why would he relate to his son and daughter just with a, a test for some type of random fruit? So the fact is that Adam and Eve risked their lives for this fruit. Adam and Eve were told by God that they would die the moment they ate the fruit, if they still ate it. Adam and Eve did not lack for physical food, nor did they lack the love and attention of God. So it seems like they had everything. They would not have risked their lives and disobeyed God only to obtain some literal uh, food delicacy, some special delicious fruit. Therefore, we can surmise that the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil could not have been any type of ordinary fruit. Rather, it must have represented something so extraordinarily stimulating and tempting that even the fear of death did not deter them from partaking in it. I think about that. What could be so tempting, even though they had everything? They, they had all of God's love. They had all the other fruits and everything else they needed in the garden. What it could have been so tempting that they would even risk their eternal life? In order to unravel the true meaning of the Bible story about the fall, let's take a closer look at some of the other components of the story first. While there must have been many trees in the Garden of Eden, again, there's only two that are named. One was the Tree of Life. And we may think, again, this tree doesn't sound like a name for a normal tree, right? Does anybody have a tree of life growing in their backyard or in their neighborhood? Probably not. But since we have already established that the Bible is full of symbols and parables, it's reasonable to ask, was this a literal tree or was it symbolic? But what is the meaning of the tree of life? We find that the Bible often uses trees as symbols. What does this tree of life represent? Proverbs 13, 12, it says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. So we can think, what is really the des deepest desire of human beings? So the deepest desire of human beings, we can say, is to really fulfill our purpose of life, to become one in heart, 
and in love with our Heavenly Father, right? If we can be one with God, we would lack nothing. John 15, 5, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. So Jesus is comparing himself to a vine or tree who is the source of life and blessings. And we read further in Revelation 22, 14, blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the, the gates into the city. So having the right to access the tree of life requires obedience to God's commandments, right? Adam and Eve were given a, a, a commandment not to eat the fruit. That was the very first commandment. And then at, as a result of the fall, again, they were denied that result or sorry, were denied that um, access to the, to the tree of life. So what is the meaning of the tree of life? It was Adam's desire to reach maturity, perfection of heart, and become one with God. So Adam himself was to become a tree of life, a giver of life, a, a tree, is, but just as Jesus compared himself to a tree or to a vine with branches. So we conclude that the tree of life symbolizes a true man or perfected Adam, a man who has fully realized the ideal of creation. And had Adam, who was created as God's son, been obedient to God's commandment, he would have continued to grow in the love of God. Right? If he had kept the commandment, he would not have separated from God. He would be he would have stayed within God's realm. So had he fulfilled his portion of responsibility, he would have become not only a true son, he would have been and fulfilled the first blessing, he would become a true husband and a true father, and he would be the root of a sinless lineage of mankind. So think about that. If there was no fall, then all of Adam and Eve's children would have been born sinless. But then what is meaning the meaning of the tree standing next to the tree of life? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Could this be a literal tree which could bring about man's separation from God? Could eating a literal fruit be the original sin which destroyed man's spirit and put him under Satan's control? Once again, God is speaking the truth in the Bible using metaphors. So then what does this tree symbolize? Again, there were two trees in the garden. One, the tree of life, represents true Adam. And what does the other tree represent? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents none other than the woman, Eve. So what was it about Eve that was so tempting to Adam that he would disobey God and risk his eternal life to obtain it? So we will talk more about this tree and the fruit later and about really what, what tempted um, Adam and Eve. Then we're also going to be looking more closely at the serpent. What about the serpent? Is this a literal snake or is this also symbolic? So what do we know about the story of the serpent in the Bible? So he was able to speak. The serpent was a spiritual being who knew the will of God, was originally a being of goodness, right? It was a being who was thrown down from heaven. And this being was able to dominate Adam and Eve after the fall. So based on the description, the serpent in the garden also does not appear to be a literal snake, right? Because there's no, there's no physical literal snake in nature that has these characteristics. So what is it that this uh, snake represents? What being is it that God created that has all these characteristics? Okay, this being is known as the devil and Satan. Revelation 12, 9 says, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So based on the, the story of Genesis, the Bible gives a lot of insights really about the nature and true identity of the serpent. And also in the book of Isaiah, we read how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. So again, this being, Lucifer, who had angels under him, says he had his angels, was in heaven, means with, with God, and then was thrown down to the ground or separated from God. 
So the Bible refers to the serpent in the Garden of Eden as the devil, Satan, and Lucifer. So the disciples of Jesus also spoke about the nature of the serpent, a being who speaks with forked tongue, right? A, a divided tongue, saying one thing, but lying and, and you know, misleading people in, in, in another direction. First, John tells us that tells us that destroying the works of the devil was actually the reason Christ appeared in 1 John 3, 8. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was, mani Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And in 2 Corinthians 11, 3, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is Christ. And then in the book of John, we are taught that we have actually inherited this evil, sinful nature from the devil. Just as a child inherits the characteristics of his own father. And this is very critical. It says, you are of your father, the devil, the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So again, if we think none of us are perfect, all of us have sin. So we, whose nature do we reflect? Are we reflecting the nature of a perfect, true Adam and Eve? No, we are, we are reflecting the, uh, the nature of, of Satan or the nature of the devil. In conclusion, we can say there is no doubt that the serpent in the story of the fall of man is actually the archangel Lucifer, right, who was originally with God in heaven. He was rejected by God. He was thrown down when he rebelled against God by, receive, by deceiving God's children into acting against God's commandment. So he knew very well what God's commandment was, and he knew what he had to do to separate them from God. So now that we've identified the key elements of the story of the fall, we need to go deeper into understanding the process and the motivation of the fall also. The more we can understand the nature of the devil, the better equipped we are to recognize his works and the closer we can come to our Heavenly Father. And that's what we want to do, right? So in our next presentation, we'll go more into the details, the process, and the motivation of the fall.